Welcome to Access Church. We're stoked you're with us. Before we get into the teaching today, grab your Bible, your note sheet, and maybe your favorite beverage, and be ready to receive all that God has for you today. Last week, you can leave that, leave that there. Yeah, you're good. Um, so we had like almost all of our volunteers, worship team, like just, we had a wave go through our church, no doubt, with flu, COVID, kind of a mix. Everyone with COVID healed, recovered, doing well. Most were asymptomatic, and uh, the ones that did were just tired, lost some taste, things like that. And so, um, yeah, so healthy, it's good, good to be back, good to see everybody. It's where you take one week off, like, I feel like we haven't seen each other in a while, so... Glad that you guys are here. Um, we're going to jump into a few things uh, this morning. And so before we do, just want to let you know, we got these cool things. Can everyone give a hand to Andrew back there? Just, even if you don't know him, give him a hand. 
he got these going for us. And so um, we have door hangers and we have a uh, little like, I guess you call them business cards. Uh, but just kind of equipping our church. Just one of those things of always being ready. Like you just never know. Uh, the door hangers, this is something that we've done since we started our church. And probably what we'll do is just after Sunday sometime, it could be a small group of us, whatever. We're just going to be like, hey, we're just going to walk around neighborhoods, kind of pray, put these on the, you know, doorknobs of people or the, their, uh, their house and just see what God does. And it's always cool. It's always surprising as we're just walking around. Sometimes you have conversations, sometimes none. But we've had people come to our church through these. So we'll see what God does. We'll hit the neighborhoods around here. So just a heads up on that. And then the cards are in the back table. So you can just grab as many as you want. And just you never know uh, what God's going to kind of do. Um, one other thing right now is uh, the need in children's ministry. Uh, if you're not volunteering, we are looking for about one or two more people. We have a few people in children's ministry that are pulling double duty. So they're serving in multiple ministries. They're going to get exhausted. And so it's one of those things, if you're not serving, uh, it's a great place just to go in, invest in little kids, uh, love on them. Uh, and the children's ministry really sets you up where it's not a lot of work during the week. You kind of show up and just love on these kids. And so uh, one or two more people we're looking for, you can write on the, the communication cards that we have for you. You can uh, write children's ministry on there and just stick it on the table. We'll grab it and probably call you within 30 minutes of the service ending. Um, or you can just talk to me, uh, Laura Lee, Nayeli, and just let us know. And uh, even if something you want to try out, like, you're like, ah, I kind of like kids, I'm not sure. We'll try you out just to make sure it's a good, it's a good uh, fit. So, um, but we would appreciate that. All the other ministries are doing great, uh, fully staffed. Uh, so thank you to all who are volunteering week in and week out. Uh, the thesis before we jump into the passage, and actually before we jump into a passage, uh, Jason, as you guys know, um, enjoys writing poems. He shared them before in church. Wrote a poem that I thought would go well with a sermon today. Um, it's very descriptive. It gets us into the story. And so I'm going to pray. And then he's going to share the poem, and then we're going to read the passage. But here's the thesis for today. And it's really important for us because, this, remember, in the book of Acts, uh, we're reading about the mission of the Holy Spirit. Jesus uh, was here actively, as far as directly, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We saw the biography. He goes up to heaven. Why did he leave us? So he could give us his spirit so that it wasn't just God walking with people. It was God being in people and changing them from the inside out. So that's the mission. The mission, the, uh, uh, the words we're using for this series is the Holy Spirit is on a mission. It's important to know what kind of mission we're on because it'll help you understand life and why you might go through certain things. Because I think some of us get confused and I want to clarify today. The thesis for today is the mission of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to prepare us and train us to love so sacrificially that people see Jesus, not us. It's really important because you're going to be very frustrated in your walk with God if you don't get this. The Holy Spirit's primary purpose is to prepare you and to train you to love so sacrificially because the Bible says who is love? God. Okay, good answer. Yeah, yeah. If you ever don't know what to answer, say God and Jesus. Most of the time you're going to be spot on, all right? The Bible says God is is he's the definition of love if he's the definition of love and he comes into our life he's transforming us which also indicates that we're not naturally loving people we desire to be we sing about it we watch movies about it but day in day out so the, the holy spirit has to do this transformational work in us but the goal is to love so sacrificially that the world and people we 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 love so sacrificially that they see Jesus, not even us. That's the goal. That's going to help make sense of today's story. Because if you don't get that, today's story is a tragedy. But actual, it's not a tragedy. It's a love story, if you get it. Let me pray, and then Jason's going to come up. Jesus, um, today's going to be hard for us. Because what you're trying to do is sometimes what we're trying to resist. And this is an area for our church, God, where we got to get it or we'll never grow as a church, both spiritually or even reaching people. I just think it's pivotal. So God, would you unite us in humbling ourselves and understanding what mission you're on, not just around us, but what mission you're on through us. That it would transform our marriages our families, our friendships, 
But most importantly, it would transform the way we do church and ministry and view the church that you love. So Jesus, we, uh, we give this time to you. Do your work, Lord. Teach us and train us. In your name, amen. This is called the foot of some coats. A rock whizzes by my face. Soon, another one takes its place. Rocks are coming at me from different directions. My eyes are so swollen that there is no perception. Sweat and blood mingle, then drain into my eyes. They feel as if they're being fried. Every time that I'm hit by a stone, I feel the agonizing pain as it yet breaks yet another bone. My body is so weak that I sink to my knees as I was put to death by a decree. Before this happened, there was a concession, and I was chosen among the seven. Seven men of faith and the Holy Spirit. To me, being chosen was like a beautiful lyric. I was a healthy the willow, widow. Inside me, I felt my spirit billow. There were some who did not like my faith, and I would debate them and put them in their place. They tried to trip me up with the words that they would say, but I was so steadfast that I did not sway. So they brought up false accusations towards me, and I was given a trial by a jury. Of course, I was found to be in the wrong, but through all this, I remained strong. My once dark skin is now painted in purple and blue as rock-sized bruises bleed through. On my knees, I look up to see so grand, the son of man standing at God's right hand. This was the ending to my story, seeing God in all his glory. Before I passed, I heard the laughter and the gloats. And the last thing I remember is seeing is a man at the foot of some coats. Awesome. Thank you, bro. This is... Uh the story of, in Acts chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, you can put the lights up for everybody. Um, Acts chapter 7. And Jason kind of summarized that whole chapter. And so, um, and that's something too, if you want that poem, kind of ties in with today. You can talk to him. You can um, email it to her or get it to you. Uh, or you can email me because I have the poem also. But um, the last part of Acts chapter 7 is what we're going to focus on because it it, again, it seems to be a tragedy that sometimes we have a hard time understanding. We're going to be in verse 54 through 60. And I think, uh, do we have the, the verses, Acts chapter 7 for everybody? Awesome. Maybe we could take off the graphic. Even though it looks cool, you can't read it. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. Acts seven fifty four through 60. As he just described, um, Stephen was a, um, a man that the Bible says full of the Spirit. And it's interesting that the first thing he was to do, being full of the Spirit, was to help feed and organize widows and women who were abandoned to make sure that they were allocated food because they didn't have government subsidies like we have today. It was the church, your family, or nothing. And that's when the church was like, yes, we could shine. The church was meant to shine in the darkest moments. And so, um, so he was one of seven people chosen. And it's interesting that you'll see, it's a side point here, is that when God has something big for you, he's going to give you something little to be responsible with. Some of us have these big plans that God wants us to do, but we're not taking care of the little things he's asked us to do. So he can't trust us yet. So the plans are greater but the responsibilities have to start with something smaller. That's how God tends to work. So he's like, can you just take care of these women? Nothing super miraculous. He wasn't walking on water. He wasn't healing. We don't see any miraculous things. Again, God's love doesn't always have to be in the supernatural. It could be in the natural. And so he did this with faithfully, and then God gave him more. It was to now go and preach to a crowd um, that did not know and understand a relationship with Jesus. He did this, and then we pick up in verse 54, that when he was done with this, it says, uh, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, that's the, the leadership um, uh, within the Jewish religion, they were furious, furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, 
I see heaven open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Verse 57, at this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Um, a riot broke out, right? And, and it's interesting because we look back and we think, what an archaic, like stoning someone, like archaic times and, you know, people, they weren't as evolved as we are today and all that. Well, we can see even in our society today how quickly a riot can erupt, destruction, people just lashing out, right? And so it happened then. It can happen very quickly. And so it says that they dragged him out, began to stone him. And meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, who later on will become Paul. But for now, this man was one of the leaders to begin to uh, assassinate and kill Christians because they did not want this, what they viewed uh, as a cult, to flourish at all. Not only was it not spiritually they felt like good for them, but also was not financially good for them either. And so it says that in verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, which is absolutely nuts. Like if you just stop, slow down and read the Bible, because sometimes we over-spiritualize it. Probably not in the forefront of my mind if rocks are coming at me. While rocks are hitting this guy, this is how full of the Holy Spirit he was. Not even thinking about the people that are throwing the rocks, but thinking about Jesus. Very important. If we're going to sacrificially love, that means that love is difficult. Sacrifice means that there's something that, there's a loss there, there's a hurt there. That's what sacrifice means. And the Bible's going to show us that the only way to do that is to look past people and to see God. Anytime where love is impeded in my life or is lacking, or I, I don't want to sacrifice, usually I'm looking at people, not at God. So while rocks were flying, he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Isn't that interesting? He didn't say, protect me from the stones. He didn't say, give me more years. One of the things we see that in order to, to supernaturally or sacrificially love, we almost have to, to let go of this world's expectations and this world. When we hold on to this world, what it wants to give us, comfort, money, consuming, me, 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 entertainment, all that kind of things, we're holding on to something that's going to make it difficult for us to sacrificially love because that's a supernatural kind of love. The world doesn't understand it, doesn't understand it, but the Bible explains it and God reveals it. The only way for us to do that is to, again, look beyond people, keep our eyes on Jesus, but also he said, receive my spirit. What he saw was that sacrificial love, the end game, was not to gain this world, but to gain eternity. He was ready to go to heaven. He was already thinking of heaven. So loving sacrificially was easy because he saw a greater purpose, he saw a greater vision, he saw a greater mission. When I tend to think that this world is all I got, it's going to be difficult for me to love because I'm going to hold on to everything in this world and I'm going to protect it. And if someone tries to come against me, I'm not going to love them because it's about what I get here on earth. I'm not even thinking about heaven. But when I realize I get way more in heaven than I get here on earth, I can give things away. I can give money away. I can give time away. I can lose myself because this isn't what defines me. If I'm just being honest, this passage, when I read it, I wrestled with it because... Um, I don't know if I'd be saying receive my spirit. I'd say protect me so I can go back to my family. So I can see my kids grow older. So I can grow old with my wife. So I can have that farm out of Jerusalem that I always want, right? All my dreams are dashing, but I'm dreaming the dreams of the world, not the dreams of heaven. So he didn't ask for a miracle to stay here. He asked for the miracle of going to see Jesus. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, which, again, this passage gets more and more insane if we think about it. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep, which is just a term of he died. I don't know about you, but if you've ever had someone throw rocks at you or maybe verbal rocks or maybe Facebook post rocks or whatever the, the new rocks are, right? We've had that, that hurt. If we're honest, and I don't know if we'll be totally honest, I won't have you share this in groups, so don't worry. You don't have to share this out loud. But 
Am I saying, Lord, do not hold this sin against them? Or is it, I'm going to get revenge? How dare they? Why? Because I'm protecting my reputation, who I am. And I can't sacrificially love if I'm trying to protect everything that I have and who I am. You see, we've, many of us read this passage and we think, man, that stinks. I mean, this dude had so much potential. Again, he was an early leader in the church, which means he was probably a young guy. Shouldn't God use him here? Couldn't he use him more powerfully here on earth? He had so much potential, and God's like, no, no, the greatest potential is in heaven, not here on earth. This was a love story. This is about a man who loved God so much, he didn't say, keep me here, I'm ready to go. This is a man who was so in love with God that he allowed the forgive. he understood how much God forgive, forgave him, that then even while stones were flying, he was able to forgive them. And the people that hated him, his desire was that they would know Jesus. He wasn't even considering himself. How do we get to this type of place as a church? Because this is monumental because the church from here, just so you know, this is a transition from Acts 7 to Acts 8 and on, the church explodes. And the church doesn't explode through amazing programming. Doesn't, it doesn't explode as far as the preaching just got better and tighter and the air conditioning, all that, all those things that we think what we need to reach people. It exploded because all of a sudden the church saw sacrificial love in a way that just, boom, people were ready to go. And God forced them to go. It's a love story about a man who loved Jesus and Jesus who loved a man so much that he said, you're not going to stay here. I'm going to bring you into heaven. The mission of the Holy Spirit in Stephen's life, in the early church's life, in the book of Acts and in our lives is to prepare us and train us to love so sacrificially that people see Jesus, not us. How does this happen? How do we get there? Uh, a few things, if you want to write these things down, kind of two things uh, for us to think about today. How we get there as a church, how we get there in our families, how we get there in the, uh, in the way that we love each other, is first of all, this mindset is that I'm okay that I will lose so that others will gain. I will lose so that others will gain. And I think how many of us do love is you can gain as long as I gain just as much. Otherwise, I'm, my, my love for you, it's going to begin to trick. It's going to begin to uh, dry up. Now, I know right now you guys would be like, ah, oh, that's not the way we should do it. Yeah, but if we were to honestly look at our lives, if our lives were written down like Stephen, if I, if I knew everything and if you knew everything in me the last two months, the last six months, the last five years, what would our love look like? Would it look, look sacrificial or would it look more reciprocal? Right? Well, I'm going to love based off, yeah, and you pick up that stone. And so how do we get to this place of sacrificial love is that I think for Stephen and what we saw in the early churches, they were willing to lose so that others will gain. And here's the interesting thing is it sounds like a paradox, right? Wait, that I'm going to lose, then it doesn't feel like it's a, it's a win-win. And here's where it's a win-win is that this is where the Bible says that truly you don't ever lose. Because if you have God, he gives you everything you need even if they can't give it to you. And it's hard, though, because sometimes when we're losing, we don't see the win. Right? And that's where we got to have that heavenly perspective. That's where we got to have that faith that as I lose, I'm trusting God that he will make a win here. I don't think while Stephen was looking to Jesus, he could imagine that Saul, who was the leader of this, the perpetrator of it, the organizer of it, who would go on to kill more people after this. While he, the rocks were flying, he didn't get a quick apology. While he said, Father, forgive them, Saul didn't say, stop, everyone stop. Bro, tell me about this Jesus. This is amazing. Nothing happened right there. It looked like a loss where he's like, this isn't doing anything. <laughs> Why did you put me in this position? Like, there's nothing good coming out of this. And I, I, here's why I want to encourage you is that sacrificial love is an aspect of faith. 
And when I cannot trust God, I will not love like God. Because I believe that he can't resurrect the dead. That he can't make a hating person a loving person. And if he can't do it, then I'm not going to do it. And so things can look very difficult for us, and it looks like it's this paradox of I'm going to lose, and they're going to lose, and we're all going to lose. So I'm going to stop losing. I'm just going to hold on. I'm going to keep, I don't want to give any more. And what Stephen couldn't imagine is that God would use this to bring Saul to him. If you were to ask Stephen while the stones were flying, hey, that guy over there, do you think he's a good leader of the church? I, don't, I think he'd be like, eh, <laughs> you know, get him into heaven, but I don't see him being a leader as rocks are flying. But that had to burn into Saul's mind. That man's face. He didn't hate. He didn't run. He didn't even cry. He said, receive my spirit and forgive him while I go to heaven. That has to tweak you. That has to be like, what the heck just happened? And God would use that and other circumstances to eventually not just bring Saul to a relationship with God. He would be a leader in the church, and we're going to study him the rest of the book of Acts. When I understand that I lose so that others will gain, it's a step of faith. But there's also a grief there. And we have to recognize that. Part of love is sadness. Any parent knows that. <laughs> the parents are nodding right now. I say, yep, I love my kids, and my soul has grieved, <laughs> right? And what you got to make sure is that grief keeps your heart soft so you can continue to love and not turn towards anger and bitterness towards them. That's the hard part. Stephen was able to keep his heart soft, saying they don't understand. Most of the time when people hurt you or throw rocks, they don't understand. When people, you're trying to reach them for Jesus, right? We're in this phase of trying to reach people for Jesus, and they don't get it. Yeah, because it's a spiritual battle. It's not a relational one. And the Bible says, how do we win the spiritual battle? It's not even through gifts. It's through sacrificial love. Sacrificial love is what wins this war. And we got to get that. Because for our church to grow, for your marriage to grow, for your family to grow, for maybe your ministry that you're in, for God to grow it, it's going to take having a sacrificial love mindset and actions. This is why uh, Jesus said this, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Everything that has been a God thing in our history is done through great sacrificial love. Any of us that have read about the great missionaries, there's a great movement of missionaries in the 19th century, in the 1800s. I don't know if you've read that. If you've been to Bible college, things like that. You should be required reading. But we've had these movements in our country's history where we sent born missionaries. And I don't know if you know this today, we actually receive more missionaries to America than we send. First time in our nation's history. So when we talk about, oh, we're God's nation, just so you know, God's sending missionaries to save our nation. <laughs> so first time in history, more missionaries come in here than we send. Not true in the 19th century. But you read those stories, they're tragedies, you guys. When God does something great, I think we tend to think when God does something great, my hair grows back, I get more money, I get more acclaim, people are praising me like, you're such an amazing Christian, right? We tend to think it's prosperity gospel. We don't call it that, but we all believe it. <laughs> If God's going to do something great, that means I'm going to be elevated. And God's like, so no, you're going down. <laughs> because the less of you, the more of me. The more of you, it kind of messes things up. I don't know if you know that. Any of you that have a great desire to do ministry for God, you will be less and God will be great. And stones will fly. So be prepared to keep your eyes on Jesus and not on the people throwing the stones. It's the only way you can save them. Whether it's your kids, whether it's someone in your family, or whether it's in our church, or whether it's in our community. And greater love is, there's nothing, it's the definition is this. I'm going to sacrifice my wants, my desires, my privilege, my position, my comfort, anything I can do to bring you to Jesus. Now, sacrificial love helps others gain what is good and holy, not what they desire or request. Understand that. Sacrificial love helps others gain what is good and holy, not what they desire or request. That's the difference between being sacrificially loving and codependent. A codependent person only does what that other person wants, even if it's unhealthy and unholy. Have you seen those? 
or maybe some of us have been there, or maybe some of us like, that's me, go to bed, right? I kind of just placate to that person, even if it's evil or wrong. That's not, just so you know, like godly. Godliness is that sacrificial love is, I'm going to do what is best for you, even if you don't want it. Because notice they told them to shut your mouth. And he wasn't like, oh, okay, I'm going to sacrifice my desire. Okay, no. No, sacrificial love then means I'm willing to sacrifice even what you think about me. And I'm going to do what's good for you, even if you don't think it's good, and even if you think I'm wrong for doing it. Sacrificial love is a mandate from God, not from other people on you. Does that make sense? A codependent person is a mandate on what that other wants of me. A sacrificially loving person says, you don't dictate, God dictates. And even if you don't agree, I'm going to keep loving, showing mercy, and trying to serve you in a way that brings you to him. Uh, 1 John 3, 16 through 18, and that's not John 3, 16, that's 1 John. There's another one in the New Testament. It says this, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us love with words or speech. Um, not love with just words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So it's not a false love, it's in truth. I remember when I was um, uh, a lifeguard at Oceanside Beach, um, and uh, really on fire for God. I remember it was a time where it was just like, I just wanted to serve him, love him, all that kind of stuff. And I wasn't working for the church yet. And um, if you want to talk about a dark place, some of us work in dark places. If you're in the restaurant industry, I was a waiter for seven years. Like, you want to reach people that are really far, work as a waiter or a waitress. Like, you're going to meet just all kinds of craziness. And so uh, I was in that environment. Well, lifeguarding is the same thing. Kind of known as partiers, if you didn't know that. Uh, they enjoy drinking, they enjoy themselves and their bodies and pleasure and all that kind of stuff. It's on a heightened level. What a great test for me as a missionary. Because I really just viewed myself as not just a lifeguard, but a missionary. Um, and I knew I wanted to get into ministry, but it wasn't quite, I wasn't quite there yet um, as far as being able to uh, go full-time ministry. So I was working as a lifeguard. And um, I remember I used to get mocked a lot. And uh, two guys in particular, one had a drug problem and actually would get fired later that year. He couldn't break the drugs. Um, and another guy was just incredibly conceited. Um, he was very successful as a lifeguard, financially very well off, good looking dude, kind of had, the, just had it, like just popular, good with words, good looking, had, one of those people you look at and they got it all. But what's interesting, he had nothing. He used to mock me. I remember I used to uh, go there and he would purposely tell me about his weekend and all the sex that he had just to try to bother me. Um, and so as I was, you know, they knew I was part of church and all that kind of stuff. I felt like a loser the whole time when I was a lifeguard, you know, and they would try to get me to get drunk, right? And so I would, you know, have, a, you know, a drink with them and they would try to get me to, I knew what they were trying to do. They're always trying to goad me, always trying to, but I realized this was a spiritual battle, not just a relational one. This wasn't about, and I was trying to see, I remember his name was Jose. I was trying to see Jose as God saw him, not how I saw him. Cause I thought he was arrogant and I would love to fight him. But I knew he'd probably take me down, so I never did. Uh, so um, he was a big, big dude. And uh, if I saw him from a human point of view, I, I, I'd view his stones as a personal attack. But I knew it's like, this dude's empty. Even though the world would say he has it all, he's empty. Well, I quit lifeguarding, the season goes. I'm done. I get hired on at the church. And I never see those guys again. I'm like, I didn't bring one person to church. I thought I was the worst missionary. I'm like, I suck. I should just work at a church because outside the church, I suck. People don't come to know God. You know, it's just, it seemed like nothing happened. Two years later, who do you think I see walking to church? Jose. And I think my response literally was like, what are you doing here? Like literally like, why? You have everything. Why do you need this church? Well, it's amazing how God works that when a man looks like he has it all, but his marriage is falling apart because he doesn't know how to relate to a woman or love a woman. And all of a sudden you start losing kids and a wife, how it breaks you down, right? And he knew he needed something. And I remember talking to him and I'm just remembering like, how do you find our church? He's like, I just remembered 
North, the North Coast, that was the church. <laughs> he goes, all of our conversations I knew, and he looked it up, came to church. The guy that was on drugs, Scott Prather, he would come in within months after Jose. Same thing, bro, what are you doing here, <laughs> you know? Got cleaned up, went into rehab. Wife gave him the ultimatum. If you want to stay married, you better get your crap together. This is done. He knew he needed God. 20 years later, both those guys would still be at the church that I was at. Scott would be on the worship team. Jose would be remarried, following Jesus. That, that's, if you're going to clap, that's probably the best time to clap. If you're going to clap. Look at some of you guys are going to do a golf clap. Mm, happy Jesus story. You guys, the reason I tell this is this. It has nothing to do about me. If it was left up to my flesh, I would punch those guys in the face. They were destructive. They were vulgar. vulgar they were demeaning. They tried to um, emasculate me, embarrass me, and try to draw me to do evil that I didn't want to do. But if your eyes on Jesus, if you realize your own forgiveness, how much he's loved and sacrificed for you, how can we not? That's the beauty of keeping your eyes on Jesus. I'm going to love like him, not how they love me. And that's when things grow. How do we get there? Simply this. The Bible would say is, I must die so that God will live in me. It's the only way, you guys. And this is what stinks about being a Christian, if I'm honest. I think we want to be in relationship with Jesus. We don't want to be transformed by him. No, I just want him to be my friend. I don't want him to actually live in me and then kill me and he lives in me. If we're just being honest. I know that in my life that's difficult. And as a pastor, I get to see your guys' lives. <laughs> it's difficult for us. Because I think I want to be in relationship with God. I don't want to be transformed by him. And how does he transform us? Less of you. Less of what people think about you. Less of what you think about your own money, your own time. What people's opinions are. Your reputation. What if I just didn't think about that? I kept my eyes on Jesus saying, what do you want? How do you want me to love? How do you want me to speak? How do you want me to encourage? How do you want me to take the bullets? How do you want me to take the stones when they're thrown at me? That I do it in a way where they just see you and not me. So when I must die, that means my will, my perceptions of this world and people, my self-preservation and my selfishness must go. And that's when the love of God comes in and a heavenly perspective comes in. And I'm now a child of God, not a child of this world. Now I'm a Christian more than an American. This is why Paul wrote in Galatians 2, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. This was the guy that killed Stephen. This is what he wrote. How do you go from a murderer to a missionary? How does it happen? I have been crucified with Christ. This is why it makes sense in Matthew 10 where Jesus says, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Do you know what take up the cross means? I've heard sermons on that and they try to like, like make it religious and pretty. It's really simple. It means I go on the cross and I kill myself, my will. Just like Jesus died and then he rose again through the power of the Holy Spirit, I rise again through the power of the Holy Spirit, which means now being full of the Spirit like Stephen, I can love sacrificially just like God. Love sacrificially. And this is the journey our, our church is on. You know, when we talk about reaching people, I just, this story is not a tragedy. It's a, it's a challenge for us. It's a love story. How are we going to be a church that God uses? The only way, I'll just be honest with you, the only way we're going to see fruit is by being less of a, us and allowing not just to have a relationship with God, but God to transform us and live in us. And then how is he going to lead you as he, lives in, as he lives in you to love sacrificially? That means loving your kids sacrificially. That's your greatest missions. Your first missions, if you have a family, is learn to reach your kids. And then you reach your neighbors. And then God will give you ministry after that. He'll give you a focus after that. Some of us, we might have to sacrifice the comforts of this world. For some of us, God might be calling, saying, hey, forget about the American dream. What about going to Thailand? What about going to the underground church in China? What about Africa? 
and I'm willing to give up a church that I love, a city that I love, the comforts maybe that I love, because I have a heavenly perspective. I don't know. I just know that that's how the Holy Spirit's going to lead us. And here's the thing is what I want you to understand is it's not a paradox. And just so you know, whatever you lose, you gain more in Christ. And whatever you lose here on earth, you will have gained more in heaven. And heaven is forever. This earth is only for about 50, 60, 70, 80 years. I just want to encourage us as a church. I wish we were in discussions this week. I think we produced some powerful discussions. We're not. But I hope you can kind of think about this week of what it means to die to yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to live in you. And, and, and for, for people to see Jesus in you, it's not by looking super spiritual and saying a bunch of Christian words. It's about just they look at you and they go, that's a sacrificially loving person. And when stones fly, he's not condemning that, those people. His eyes are actually on Jesus or her eyes are on Jesus. This is going to help for the church to explode. And that's where we're going to be after this in Acts chapter 8 and on. But I just want to stop and look at this story because it can be a hard story for some of us where it's like, this just seems bad. But no, it's actually a learning lesson for us all. The mission of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to prepare and train us to love so sacrificially that people see Jesus in life, not us. And I want to encourage you with this. This is a unique story. Because for some of us, it's like, oh my gosh, what's, gonna, what's God going to bring into my life? It's like, is he, you know, you, I've heard these before where it's like, you know, come on, you need to go die for God. And all that. First of all, it was just Stephen that was called to this. No one else. For some of us, God might have a calling, a specific calling where it's going to be a little more intense than for others of us. But Stephen was called to this because he was ready for it. God said, you're the man for this job. Most of us are not going to experience rocks being thrown at us. So how do we apply this? Again, it's looking at difficult situations or difficult people or just looking at our lives saying, if I'm going to be successful, well, it comes down to this. There will never be success without sacrifice. There will never be success without sacrifice. For us to be a successful church, for me to be successful as a Christian, I must embrace the sacrificial life rather than trying to avoid it and living the American comfort consuming life. So that's what you get to wrestle with this week. <laughs> but again, I hope it produces good fruit because that's when we're going to flourish. Again, in our families and our friendships and most of all in God's church, reaching people for him no matter what the cost. And I'll tell you what, looking back, Jose and Scott, seeing them come to, to know Jesus, just so you know, I would go back and take another two years of being made fun of if I knew that was the end result. Mock me all you want. If you're going to come to Jesus, mock me all you want. And that's where we just got to trust God and what he's doing. The worship team's going to come up now, and I think I've given you a little bit maybe to reflect on today, but hopefully viewing this story as a love story, not a tragedy, um, and what God is doing in our lives. So uh, as the worship team comes up, I just want to remind you, um, do we have uh, praying? Anybody? Yeah? Okay, we're good for prayer. So um, I'm going to have uh, the prayer team um, by the chairs over there if you need prayer for anything. Hey, you guys, also, too, if you can encourage our prayer team, they, they love praying for you. Don't make it about you. They, they have a gift. They just they want to love you by praying. And also, I appreciate our prayer team. Um, we get to go to people's homes just, you know, during the week and depending on their schedules, and we get to go pray over people's homes. What a huge blessing in helping people to learn how to pray for their own home. If that's something you want, whether sometimes we wait for something freaky or weird to happen, it's like, ah, I get prayer. These people just love to pray. So whether it's right now or you want us to come over to your house, we would love to love on you and just and, and, and pray for you in your home in any way possible too. So prayers in the back there. We got communion, which always reminds us of God's sacrificial love, which is a great reminder for us that, okay, not just thank you, Jesus, but help me to be like you, Jesus. Maybe that's our prayer today as we're taking communion. You can take communion during any time during worship. Jesus, God, I just pray that we would be a church that we would reach people that you want us to reach and that we would do whatever it takes. God, I pray that we would be spiritual investors, not worldly consumers. 
that we view money as a way to be generous and support missionaries or, or just help people in need and sacrificially love our finances. We would see our time, God, not as something that's for us just to enjoy and relax, but to invest into others, to encourage, to speak words, to pray. So God, I pray our church would not be afraid of some rocks when they're thrown. We would keep our eyes on you, Jesus, and we would love as you have loved us, that we would love others. We worship you now. Speak to us. Encourage us. Prepare us for this week. In your name, Jesus, amen.
and the praise is yours. You're the one we bow before. Reigning over us as we lift you up, you will reign.
to sing one more song today. Just these songs that we've just sung as uh, Brian shared with me about sacrificial love. You know, Stephen got it. And all these words that we've been singing, I can just imagine what was going through his head. He got it. He knew he was a child of God. And he just said, bring it on. I'm going to give up my life so that you can see the glory of God and come to Jesus. Wow. And he searched the world probably in his whole life and he couldn't find that peace until he knew Jesus. Amen? So there's nothing better than him. Let's close by singing this.
Corinthians 13, it's the one that says love is patience, love is kind, right? And many of us, we put our names in there. Like, put your name in there so you become that. Well, I just want to remind you this. Um, God is love, not us. So in your life, God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy and God does not boast and God is not proud. God does not dishonor anyone. God is not self-seeking. God is not easily angered. God keeps no record of wrong. God does not delight in evil, but he rejoices in the truth. God always protects. God always trusts. God always hopes. God always perseveres. And God never fails. And if God never fails, love never fails. And if you sacrificially love, here's the win in it. No matter what you lose, it will not fail. Every seed that falls to the soil in faith will grow something. So just trust him. He's got you. It's not about you. It's about him. And let him, don't just be in relationship with him, let him transform you to become like him. This makes me excited for our church. I hope this doesn't burden you, but it frees you up with a heavenly perspective and not a worldly one. Uh, Guys, I hope you have a great week. It's great to see you. That week off was brutal. It's great to see your faces. Um, If you could grab a chair uh, that you sat on, put on, that would help us out, put it on the back there. Feel free to mingle. Have a great week, you guys. We'll see you next week. Take care. Thanks for joining us. For more resources, to get involved, or to invest in the ministries at Access Church, visit go toaccesschurch.com. Take care. <laughs>